gets cold, wave your hand, I'll turn it back up. But right now it feels a little toasty in here.
you ever owned a telescope or looked through a telescope? Yeah. Once upon a time, I was I decided when I was 35-ish that I was going to buy a telescope and I was going to learn about the stars. It was a whole new thing. I never paid any attention to that. I mean, I looked up there and I knew they were up there, but you know, I never named any of them or any of that kind of stuff. So I bought a telescope and I set it up and put it out on the back deck and I looked through it and tried as hard as I could for the next several weeks. I couldn't find anything. I could not, I did not have enough intelligence to make the telescope work. I know, right now you don't want to listen to anything else I have to say, right? <laughs> oh, well, I want to share a story this morning about a famous biologist whose name is Benno Muller Hill. Benno Muller Hill. When he was a young man, about middle school age or a little bit younger, <clears throat> his teacher invited the entire class to come over to the teacher's house and look at the telescope that he had set up on the back deck, on the back patio. And uh, he was trying to teach the kids about the, the stars. And so he had the telescope lined up for a particular star that had two moons. And he wanted the kids to see the star and the moons. And so the, the, the first kid looked down and the, and the teacher said to him, do you see the star and the moons? And, and the young man said, yes, yes. And then the next one bent down and looked through the telescope and the teacher said, do you see the star and the moons? He said, yes, yes. One by one, 15 students bent down and looked through the telescope and said that they saw the moon and the, two, the star and the two moons. And then Benno came to the telescope and he looked in it and, he, and he, the teacher said, do you see the star and the two moons? And Benno said, no. And the teacher said, well, you need to adjust the focus a little bit. And so he had him adjust the focus. And he said, well, now, you see the star and the two moons, right? And Benno goes, no, I don't see anything. And the teacher's losing his patience. And he said, well, just adjust it a little bit. And, he, and, the, and Benno tried to adjust it again. And he, he said, I still don't see anything. The teacher shoved him aside. And he bent over and he looked through the telescope. And he looked through the telescope again. And he got a funny look on his face. And he looked through the telescope again. And then he looked at the end of the telescope and noticed that the cap was still on the end. All 15 students had looked through the telescope and seen exactly what the professor told them to see. When in fact, they saw nothing. It was only Ben who had the courage to say, I don't see anything. I believe that Satan has a telescope that he wishes each of us to look through. It is the telescope of life. And Satan says he has left the cap on the end of the telescope intentionally. He says, look through the telescope. See, there's nothing at the end. There's nothing else. This is all there is. <coughs> Scripture says very plainly that Satan is a deceiver. It says in Revelation 12, 7 that he is called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. And one of the things that he wants to deceive us about is that there's nothing else. This is it. There's nothing else. There's nothing. There's no life after death. There's no judgment. There's no heaven hell. There's no accountability. Enjoy yourselves. This is all you get. You only go around once. Grab for all the gusto. That's what Satan says. He wants us to believe that. In the most recent poll that I could find, which was 2018, 73% of the people <coughs> under the age of 45 say definitively, there is no hell, there is no heaven. 73% of the people surveyed by, not part of the other one that does it all, Gullah. 72% of the people under 45 said, this is it. That tells me Satan's already won in many ways. We are only seeing what we are told to see. This is all there is. The culture teaches us that. Science teaches us that. Evolution teaches us that. And if you're smart, you'll admit this is all there is. Don't be one that rocks a boat and says, wait a minute. But I stand here as the one who says, let's look through the telescope one more time. The, the goal of my ministry is evangelism. I am an evangelist at heart. If you haven't picked up on that already. And that is, I want people to understand 
There are consequences to life. There is something beyond this. In a nutshell, I want people to believe in the resurrection. And our journey through the Gospel of Luke has brought us to the resurrection. And here is the, here is the crux of Christianity in three statements. What do you believe about the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, and the missing body of Jesus? That's the crux of Christianity. We're going to read Luke chapter 23, beginning at verse 50. Hear now the word of the Lord. And a man named Joseph, who was a member of the council, that is to say a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin, was a good and righteous man. He had not consented to the plan, their plan and action. A man of Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who was waiting for the kingdom of God, this man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And he took it down, and he wrapped it in a linen cloth, and he laid it in a tomb cut in the rock, where no one had ever lain before. It was the preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. Now the women who had come with him out of Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb, and how his body was laid, and they, they returned, and prepared spices and perfumes, and on the Sabbath they rested according to the commandment. <clears throat> now last week, if you remember, we left Jesus hanging on the cross. He was dead. He'd given up his spirit. He was done. And there his body lay. It was tradition in Rome. Uh, in the, I'm sorry. It was the Roman tradition in the first century. If the person who was condemned on the cross had no relatives, they left him up there for three days as a warning. But if the person had relatives who cared about him and those relatives were brave enough to come to the crucifixion detail, they could ask for the body to be taken down. Joseph of Arimathea was a member of the Sanhedrin. And I, I want to pause for 10 seconds and explain what that means. He was a Supreme Court judge in, in, in Hebrew terminology. There were two kinds of courts. They were, there was one called the Lesser Sanhedrin that consisted of 29 judges in every major city, when there was a large Jewish population, there was a court system. There was a 29-member judge called the Lesser Sanhedrin. There were multiple of those. And then there was a Grand Sanhedrin consisting of 79 judges, which is the equivalent of our Supreme Court. And Joseph of Arimathea was a Supreme Court judge. He sat on that council. Now, by the time Jesus had come along, that council was as corrupt as a body of officials could possibly get. They, they interpreted the laws in such a way as to line their pockets as much as humanly possible. To put it simply, they had a really good thing going. And Jesus comes along and he says, well, we don't need the temple anymore. You don't need to go to temple. You don't need personal sacrifices. You don't need the temple authorities. And the Sanhedrin goes, whoa, wait a minute, he's got to go. Because he was going to ruin their wonderful way of life. And so the Sanhedrin plotted to destroy Jesus. And they took a vote. And one of the people who opposed the vote was Joseph of Arimathea. Now he couldn't stop the crucifixion. But he could honor Jesus after the crucifixion took place. And so he was well connected. He was a powerful guy. He had no fear of Pilate. He didn't go to the crucifixion detail. He went to Pilate, the governor. He said, I would like to have the body of Jesus. And Pilate said, go, make it happen. So Joseph comes to the crucifixion detail. I'm sure he greased a few palms. And they lowered the crossbar down. And Joseph took Jesus' body off the crossbar and put him in his own tomb. <clears throat> that, that took place. Jesus died at about 3 o'clock on Saturday night, or Friday night. And technically, the Sabbath begins on, at 6 o'clock on Friday night. So they had three hours to get his body down and into the ground. And that wasn't nearly enough time to do all the things that they needed to do. And so the ladies followed. They marked the place where he was. And they said, we'll be back on, on Sunday, meaning the first day of the week. And then we'll do all the things we're supposed to do. And we're, we're going to pick up the reading of Scripture with what happens next. And I'm sure you're familiar with this. But on the first day of the week, what we call Sunday, at early dawn, the ladies came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. 
And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And the women were terrified. They bowed their faces to the ground. And the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful man and be crucified, and the third day rise again? And they remembered his words. And they returned from the tomb. And they reported all of these things to the eleven and to all the rest. And now they were Mary Magdalene and Johanna and Mary the mother of James. Also the other women were with them. Were telling these things to the apostles. But these words appeared to the apostles as nonsense. And they wouldn't believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings only. And he went away to his home, marveling and what had happened. Of course, that is the familiar Easter story. We've heard it dozens of times if we've been going to church on Easter Sunday. When Peter looked in, one of the things that blew his mind was, you all know what an Egyptian mummy, mummy looks like, right? There's strips of cloth and they're wrapped around the mummy. That's the way it was done back then. And when Peter looked into the tomb, Jesus had been wrapped like that. And except that all of that cloth was still wrapped just exactly like it was wrapped around the body, except the body was gone. It was like it was full of air and it went And everything is laying there exactly like it was wrapped around Jesus. Now, how in the world did the body get out of those burial clothings and not unwrap the cloths? And that's what blew Peter's mind. Not only was Jesus gone, his body got out of the burial clothes without disturbing the clothes. How does that happen? And so Peter runs and tells the others. <clears throat> Leader of the pack goes to find out for sure. So there you have the crux of Christianity. And so I want to ask you three questions this morning. And I want you to intellectually engage the three questions. I want to take you through these, and I want you to think to yourself, what do I really believe about these three questions? The first question is, do we have any proof that Jesus of Nazareth really existed? If there is no historical evidence, the whole thing of Christianity falls apart. Second of all, if there's proof he lived, is there any proof he died in the way described? And finally, if he died in the way described, what? happened to his body? That is the single most important question that I want you to engage intellectually and answer. I don't want you to pass over. I want you to deal with it. What happened to his body if he was alive and if he died? We're going to explore just a little bit. Is there any evidence whatsoever that Jesus physically lived? <clears throat> well, one of the coolest things that we have, there was a guy named Josephus Flavius who was a Jew. He was a rabid Jew. A Jew-Jew. You know? There was nothing else but Jew. And he wrote a 22-volume history of the Jewish people in the first century, starting with 10 years after Jesus supposedly was resurrected. Josephus came on the scene as an adult 10 years after Jesus supposedly came out of the grave. So he's, he's pretty close to the source, right? But he doesn't want Jesus destroying Judaism. So he is not a Jesus fan and he is not a Christian. But listen to what it says in this book. Quote, this is written by a man who was on the scene 10 years after Jesus was there. Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among him, had condemned him to the cross, those who loved him at the first did not forsake him. For he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold these, and then a thousand other wonderful things concerning him. And the tribe of Christians 
so named from him, are not extinct at this day. There you have, written by someone who was not a fan, three proofs. Jesus was a historical figure. He was killed on the cross, and he rose from the grave. This is written by a guy who was not a fan. Ten years after Jesus' death. Interesting. All right, well, if that's the only thing, maybe we could discount it. <clears throat> but there's a history of the Roman Empire. The Roman emperors considered themselves descended from gods. And they wanted everything they said recorded. And so two scribes were assigned to follow the Roman emperors every waking minute. And so if you want to spend 60 or 80 years, you can go read the history of the Roman Empire. One page at a time. There's a reference to the emperor Tacitus. I'm sorry, Roman historian, the Roman historian Tacitus was talking about Nero and, and Nero's explanation as to why they were born. And, and Nero blamed the Christians, the followers of Christus. And Tacitus wrote in the margin what that meant, followers of Jesus of Nazareth. <clears throat> it's interesting that when Tacitus wrote his history, if he considered the information not entirely reliable, he would have added a footnote that said, this is doubtful, but he doesn't say that. He includes it as truth. Again, somebody's not a fan. And there are other references, and I'm not going to go through all of them. But there are solid, secular, non-believer references that Jesus was a historical figure. What is interesting to me is, until the 1600s, until 1600, Nobody went on record as doubting Jesus ever lived. If you look through written history until the age of enlightenment, nobody ever doubted the historicity of Jesus of Nazareth. 1,600 years, nobody doubted it. But when the age of enlightenment came along and science came along, well, that changed everything. So, I think we can say that he lived. <clears throat> well, how about the fact that he died? Was he dead? What happened to him? Well, again, in some of those references that said he died, and so the question becomes, was he really dead when they took him down off the cross? And I offer two arguments of logic as to whether he was or was not dead. Number one, there were Roman soldiers assigned to kill people on the cross, and their job was to make sure they were dead. And there's at least one record that I know of in Roman history where the crucifixion detail failed in their job. And you know what happened to them? They were nailed to the cross. As a reminder to all soldiers, you make darn sure they're dead when they come down off of there. So the idea that Jesus would come down off the cross alive, that I just don't buy that because it would have cost the soldiers their lives. And Jesus was a serious major figure. Everybody would have known he was still alive, and the Roman authorities would have come looking for those guys. So I think that's pretty powerful. And here's the other powerful thing. His friends took his body off the cross. If his friends had felt any warmth, any heartbeat, would they have taken him and stuck him in a hole in the ground and put a 2,000-pound stone door over it so he could die a slow, agonizing death of starvation and dehydration? That's what good friends do, right? But that's what they did. Would they have done that if they felt any life in his body whatsoever? And I think the answer is no. I think it's pretty obvious. Those two things prove conclusively when he came down off the cross, he was a dead man. So that leaves us with the most crucial question. What happened to his body? <clears throat> According to scripture, and the, and the theory perpetuated for about 500 years after Jesus died, his, his disciples stole the body. And they perpetuated a fraud on humankind. Well, let's, let's, let's put that to the test. Who were those disciples? Fishermen? Farmers? Tax collector? Herdsmen? Smartest people in the culture in the first century. Amen? No. They were, they were pretty dumb, actually. And, and the idea that they would create a fraud, they would come up with this theology, this doctrine of Christian and resurrection and forgiveness of sins, that's pretty complex for fishermen. 
But the real interesting question is, why would they do that? What's in it for them? Why would you face persecution and crucifixion and your family harassment and the loss of your possessions and your job and your land and your flocks, all to perpetuate a lie? There's nothing in it for them. There's no reason for them to perpetuate a fraud. And then, of course, the fraud is based on the fact that these brave, courageous, 11 men went and stole the body from out under the nose of two Roman killers. <clears throat> well, they, this, this, the apostles' bravery is demonstrated by where they were when Jesus was crucified. Where 10 of the 11, you know where they were? They were hiding in the upper room, scared to death. I don't think the fraud theory holds up. I don't think Jesus' <coughs> body was stolen. The interesting question becomes, what have you decided? What have you decided about the missing body of Jesus of Nazareth? <clears throat> that's the crux of everything. And that's what I want you to intellectually engage with today. I don't want you to pass over that. I want to challenge you to think about that. Where is the body of Jesus of Nazareth? What happened to it? And they couldn't find it. I've told you before, if they could have found it, the temple authorities would have put it on display on Main Street of Jerusalem. They wanted to prove he was a fraud. They couldn't prove he was a fraud because the body disappeared. So what happened to Jesus' body? And keep in mind, those, bread, those burial wrappings, they were still intact. How does that work? How does that work? I have a story. Actually, I want to show you a video first. Um, I'm fascinated by near-death experiences, not because I'm fascinated by death, but by, I'm fascinated by what people have to say when they come back. So I want to show you something real quick. This is a story of somebody who was dead and who came back to life. It just, it, it gives you the, the chills. A patient on the brink of death. He had no heart rate. He had no blood pressure. He had no pulse. I mean, think about that. Like something scripted in Hollywood, says intensive care unit nurse Emily Bishop. He was down for close to 45 minutes. During which time, he claims he traveled beyond this world and back. Well, he was telling me that he loved me and that he'd seen the light and that he'd seen my mom and my dad. And I lost it at that point in time because I just lost my mom. The week after burying his mother-in-law, Brian Miller returned to work, delivering metal here in Streetsboro. I was doing fine. And then when I undid the tarp and pulled the tarp off, I started getting the tightness. Probably the cold air or asthma, he thought, until the intense pain started. I'm a truck driver. I think I'm having a heart attack. Brian was having a massive heart attack. His main artery entirely blocked, known as the Widowmaker. He was an obvious distress when we found him. Streetsboro firefighters and paramedics put the hospital on alert. Got to be real aggressive with our protocols and found the hospital as soon as we could. Can be life or death. Dr. William Wolf rushed Brian into surgery here at University Hospital's Ahuja Medical Center. We want to open up the vessel as soon as possible. Here's the blockage being cleared and blood flow restored. Man, the pain just started slowly going down. They told him that he did good by getting here as soon as he did, you know, coming quick. Not only did Brian survive the heart attack and emergency surgery, he was already up and talking. He was doing fine until he suddenly wasn't. I saw it come across the screen. I ran in there. Brian was experiencing a fatal arrhythmia called V-fib, ventricular fibrillation. Basically, his heart rate goes like this. And it's just this like scribble. And it's, his heart is just kind of like quivering in there. There's no, it's not able to pump, it's not doing anything. Emily called code blue. CPR, CPR, CPR. Strong heart, fast, CPR. A half a dozen nurses and doctors also responded pushing a whole bunch of medications um, to basically restart his heart. But at just 41, the husband and father of three was slipping away. The only thing I remember is um, I started seeing them. Started seeing the light and um, started walking towards the light. While the ICU team tried to revive Brian, he claims he was walking along a heavenly path lined with flowers and stopped by a familiar face. She was the most beautiful thing when I seen her. It was like the day after the first day I met her. We looked so happy. 
his mother-in-law Kay, who had just passed away. She grabbed a hold of my arm and she told me, it's, it's not your time, you don't need to be here. It's, we need to take you back, you got things to go home and do. And after what felt like 15 minutes, her husband Jack was back there waving at me, giving, giving me a smile. And then she just told me to go home and walk me back. But at the hospital, time was running out, or so everyone thought. We shot him four times. And on the fourth time, it still didn't work. And then out of nowhere, he got his pulse back. A normal heartbeat after nearly 45 minutes. That's pretty awesome to see. Even more incredible was Brian's condition. So if you think about that, his brain had no oxygen for 45 minutes. So the fact that he is up walking, talking, laughing, everything, I mean, that's amazing. As is Brian's memory of the white light. I just totally broke down. And I like went and sat down because I totally lost it when he told me that. But Brian says there's no reason to feel sad. The experience has changed his entire outlook on life and death. There is an afterlife and, and people need to believe in it big time. He says he's eternally grateful to the medical staff and his mother-in-law for this second chance. I need to be here a lot more longer. I got, I got three wonderful daughters and a wife. And in the end, he says, that's all that really matters. Love, very much love. In Beachwood, Suzanne Stratford, Fox 8 News. There are thousands of those kinds of stories on the internet, people that have gone to the other side. I want to tell you a story, and may not connect immediately to the rest of the sermon, but um, this is probably how we'll close. But this story takes place in a farm pond, and in the bottom of the farm pond is a bunch of muck, vegetation muck. And living in that muck is a group of larvae little warming things. And <clears throat> over the course of the lives of the family of larvae, periodically one will swim to the top, climb up a, a, the root of a lily, climb out onto the pad and never be seen again. And so a whole new generation of larvae are born and they make a promise to each other. They are not going to do that. They're not going to do what their parents and grandparents did. They, are, they made a promise that the first one that goes through the water up the lily root is going to come back and tell everybody else what's going on beyond the lily. And so one of the elder larvas one day feels this intense urge to swim to the top, and he climbs up the root of the lily, and he climbs out onto the lily leaf, and <clears throat> he begins to warm up. The pond is very cold, and he realizes the sun is very warm, and he's sitting there, and he's warming himself in the sun, and he notices a frog over here catching flies and stuff, and he says, gee, I wonder if that's what happened to everybody. And so while he's thinking about that, he, he said, well, I, I better wait and be sure before I go back and tell everybody. And so he sits and waits on the lily pad a little bit longer, and he begins to feel something kind of twitching, and he doesn't know what's going on, and then he realizes that his back just split open. And he's sitting there, and, and, he's, and he's resting in the warmth of, of the sun, and he suddenly becomes aware that he has wings. He's not a larva, he's a dragonfly. He never knew that. He's a dragonfly. And he's sitting there kind of gently moving his wings like this, and, and a breeze comes along, and all of a sudden he's in the air. And he's, he, he just naturally begins to flap. He has spent his entire life in the muck at the bottom of the pond, and now all of a sudden he's flying above the pond. He looks down, and he's most amazed, and he's excited, and it's warm and wonderful. And then he realizes he made a promise, and he's going to go back, and he's going to tell everybody at the bottom of the pond what's going on. So he goes down to the pond, and he tries to go through the water. But he's not the fat, little, heavy caterpillar that he was before. Now he's a sleek dragonfly, and he can't get through the water. He can't get through the surface of the water. And now he understood why no one ever returned. And then three things occurred to him all at the same time. Number one, he said, if I go back and try to explain it, nobody's going to understand because they don't have the point of reference. And then it occurred to him 
that that world was cold and dark and yucky, and he didn't want to go back there. And then the third thing was, he was so warm, and it was so glorious where he was, and there was such an enormous sense of freedom, he didn't even want to remember that previous life. You understand the parable? You and I live in the muck at the bottom of the pond. We think this is all there is. This is all we've ever known. We see people disappear. They never come back and tell us what happened. But would we understand if they did? Would we make fun of them and say, well, they can't possibly be telling the truth. There can't be anything beyond this life. I've told you before, I think probably the single most important thing that every person needs to do is sit by someone, sit by a loved one who's getting ready to leave this world. Sit beside of them hour after hour and watch the journey because all the games disappear. All the nonsense disappear. What's important is only what's going on. And there's some interesting things that happen. When that person passes from this world to the next and you watch that happen, there's a transformation that occurs. Some good, some bad. I think it's the most important thing you need to do for research. And also, it's a really wonderful thing to do to be with people when they pass. What did you decide? The life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus. What does that mean to you? You know, I, I have a formula, a recipe by which I make decisions. This is the last thing I'm going to say and then we're going to go home. I have a formula that I follow religiously when it comes time to make decisions. I make decisions based on which decision will generate the least negative results. For instance, when I go to play golf and it looks like it might rain, I have a decision to make. Do I drag along the umbrella and stick it in the bag, which makes it really difficult to stick the clubs in there? Or do I leave the umbrella at home and take a chance on getting wet? Which would result in the greater negative experience? And the answer is leaving the umbrella at home. It's far less of a problem to have an inconvenience than it is to be sopping wet and cold. So when it comes to the end of life, if I have lived my life believing in Jesus Christ, believing in life after death, if I've dedicated all my life to that goal and I come to the end and I find out I'm wrong, what did I lose? But if those people who do not believe in life after death, who do not believe in Jesus Christ, they come to the end and they pass through the curtain and they find out they were wrong, what have they lost? Is that a gamble worth taking? Jesus is here. What did he, was he alive? Was he dead? And what happened to his body? Answer those questions and I'll lead you out of the muck of the pond. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Holy Father, I thank you for this sermon and this illustration, and I pray that it penetrates people's hearts because there's no getting away from the fact that one day we're all going to die. It's going to happen to every single one of us eventually. And the question that we need to answer on this side is what happens? Is this all there is, or is there something else? It is a question that every person needs to thoughtfully, prayerfully, intelligently, research and come to a definitive conclusion. And I know, Father, because of the things that you've revealed to me, I know that there is another sign, that there is another life. And I pray that the people listening to these words right now will understand that, will commit their life to you, will begin the journey, of the exciting journey of connecting to you, and then they'll begin to see the proof that you're for real. I pray for them. Their hearts were touched, their lives changed, and they will choose not to live in the muck of the pond anymore. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Go in peace, honor the Lord, the days you have left.